Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to this edition of ACE, or Accelerating Clean Energy. Um, I'm delighted to see many of you here. Uh, and uh, we, have, we started organizing uh, the, this uh, annual event in 2018. And uh, this is the fourth edition of ACE. Uh, we were unfortunately not able to host these uh, during the COVID years. I'm extremely glad to welcome Mr. Gansham Prasad, uh, Chairman of the Central Electricity Authority, to deliver the keynote address this morning. Mr. Prasad, as many of us know, has a long history of working in the energy sector, and we are very grateful he has joined us today. Unfortunately, our other chief guest, uh, Mr. Amitabh Kant, former CEO of the Niti Aayog uh, and currently Sherpa to the G20, is unable to join us in person. However, he was kind enough to record a message to this conference, which I'll ask my colleagues to play in a few minutes. ACE to, uh, 2023 is being held at a time when India continues to show exemplary leadership in the adoption of clean energy, uh, keeping in mind our long-term uh, energy transition and our long-term commitments. Also, this is being held barely a week before the next COP or COP takes place in the UAE, uh, where we hope to see more direction and action uh, taken uh, at the global level. Domestically, we have seen a series of complementary and ambitious policies and regulations coming through. And I'm sure uh, Mr. Gansham Prasad will talk about some of these. In September 2023, uh, under India's G20 leadership, the country helped anchor an ambitious G20 leaders declaration, which I'm sure many of you read, uh, which seeks to fast forward uh, a new paradigm, the green development paradigm, a green development agenda. We hope the discussions and deliberations at ACE will continue to explore how to seek a stronger economy-wide transition uh, and implementation of these decisions. Let me take a few minutes to outline WRI India's uh, work and our approach. As a research organization, WRI India works on three critical transition, cru uh, transitions crucial to India's growth. Uh, these are the urban transition, the food, land, water transition, and the energy transition. On the energy transition, we work very closely with the national government, with key ministries, but also with state governments and city leadership, uh, as well as private sector, finance, uh, re other research community, uh, uh, other research organizations uh, on a range of issues from clean energy demand, by which I mean looking specifically at aspects of industrial decarbonization, uh, buildings efficiency, material efficiency, and so on, on clean energy supply, uh, specifically uh, working with the MNRE uh, on uh, offshore wind and on green hydrogen. Um, we are also doing a fair bit of research at the intersection of energy and development, particularly in rural and remote parts of the country. We've also been working on issues relating to critical minerals and materials for the energy transition um, and on decarbonization pathways for hard to abate, hard to abate sectors. Several of these issues will uh, come up during the two-day conference. Let me restate that the energy transition was never going to be simple, nor was it going to be uh, linear. And we all know that there is no playbook uh, that we can copy and just implement in India. We have to discover our own pathway, while of course there's lots of lessons uh, that we can learn from other countries uh, and that we can share with other countries. Uh, but one thing is clear, the transition has to be inclusive. And I'll talk about this a little more. Uh, we will have to look at all the resources available and make choices about which ones we want to increase and which ones we need to decrease, and whether these decisions are seasonal, whether these are non-seasonal. In our work, we have increasingly been convinced that both grid-based and decentralized renewable energy solutions will be required for consumers not just commercial and industrial consumers who have, as we know, uh, begun uh, already implementing several decentralized renewable energy solutions, 
but also rural and remote consumers where there are still several uh, pain points and, and uh, issues that still need to be uh, evened out. Eventually, the achievement of India's domestic targets and goals will result in us meeting our climate goals. And this is where the green development framing that the G20 declaration adopted is crucial. And in this journey to achieving the domestic targets, the work being carried out by the CEA or the Central Electricity Authority under the leadership of Mr. Gansham Prasad is crucial. Uh, I'm sure many of you have read the, uh, the C CEA's National Electricity Plan, uh, but what, uh, and I was just telling Mr. Prasad about this little earlier, that the level of depth, the data, the analysis that has uh, actually gone into designing the National Electricity Plan has been actually fabulous. Um, the CEA's NEP uh, for the period 2022 to 2032, which was notified earlier this year, talks about the share of non-fossil fuel-based capacity increasing to 57.4% by the end of 2026-27 and further to 68.4% by the end of 2031-32 uh, from today, which is about 42.5%. So significant increase in non-fossil fuel capacity uh, has been projected. Similarly, and I think this is something that uh, is very important for us to consider, is the projected increase in energy storage capacity. Uh, as we all know, uh, energy storage is often mentioned as being the absolute game changer in terms of uh, you know, global energy transition, but also India's energy transition. Uh, the NEP projects that uh, by 2026, 27, um, India's uh, energy storage capacity will increase to 16.3 gigawatts or 82.37 gigawatt hours by 26, 27, and an ambitious 73.93 gigawatts or 411.4 gigawatt hours of storage through a combination of battery and pump storage by the year 2031-32. Um, these projections are very important because they signal the journey India will need to undertake for firm power uh, by 2030. And I'm sure Mr. Gansham Prasad will talk about some of these issues. I will make two more points uh, uh, before calling my colleague back. Um, uh, and, and that is when we talk about the energy transition, of course, we uh, do primarily think of the power sector. And uh, this is not just because the power sector's transition is going to be critical to the energy sector, but also because the power sector is probably transitioning the fastest. Uh, but eventually the energy transition will also involve the transition of other sectors, uh, allied sectors that are dependent uh, uh, on the energy sector, notably industries, buildings, transport, agriculture, and so on. Now, not to suggest that these are not happening, but that these will pick up pace uh, over the next few years. And each of these sectors will need to design, develop, and implement specific pathways to reduce their carbon emissions. It is this sort of economy-wide approach that will help India achieve the 2070 net zero goals that we have set ourselves. Um, and we'll hear from speakers and panelists over the next uh, sessions over the next few sessions about some of these sectors, what's happening, what's not happening, what can we learn from uh, others, uh, and specifically what's been uh, what's being tried out today to improve efficiency, to to shift to low carbon options, so on and so forth. The second point uh, is that the transition will need to be affordable, inclusive, and fair, not just in terms of new technologies and the adoption of new technologies but also its impact across all sections of society. We've often heard when you, you talk about transitions uh, that there will be winners and losers. And that sort of framing is uh, it should be unacceptable. Uh, we should not have this option of saying there will be losers uh, and, uh, and, and just accept it. Um, we need to do better than that. We have to develop systems and safeguards to ensure that all of society moves forward and reaps the benefits of this transition uh, to cleaner energy. 
With, this, with these words, let me uh, welcome all of you again to ACE 2023, and a special welcome to uh, our partners who are here, um, and we will be joined by a few more uh, through the day and tomorrow, uh, and of course, uh, to Mr. Gansham Prasad. Uh, let me now request my colleague to play the video message from uh, Mr. Amitab Kant. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It is a delight to deliver these remarks at the WRI India's Accelerating Clean Energy ACE 2023 conference. I'm aware that ACE 2023 has been serving as a key platform for multi-stakeholder deliberations on critical global energy challenges for the last four to five years. I'm confident that it will continue to be a key platform to drive discussions, share insights, and pave the way for India's carbon neutral journey by 2070 and live up to its pledges on renewables and sustainable development goals. I believe such platforms are key to deliberating on critical global and domestic energy issues in nuanced ways which are extremely valuable to policy making. I strongly concur and believe that the clean energy transition is affordable and in our best economic interest and it will bring massive cost savings and economic and development benefits including job creation and improved public health. Clean energy costs have fallen sharply over the last decade making rapid transition to clean energy less costly than previously believed. It is now clear that faster and earlier clean energy transition delivers greater cost savings than slow strategies rapidly transitioning to a decarbonized energy system by around 2050 will save the world at least US dollar 12 trillion compared to business as usual while providing 55% more energy services globally than today. As part of this year's New Delhi Leaders Declaration, the G20 delivered on a landmark green development for a sustainable future with very ambitious and action-oriented commitments embedded into its pillar. The pact has reiterated that the objectives for development, climate action and growth are complementary and interrelated. Through the pact, G20 this year has committed to accelerating clean, sustainable, just, affordable and inclusive energy transitions in order to enable strong, sustainable, balanced and inclusive growth while achieving climatic objectives. It has also provided strong impetus in supporting international and national enabling environments to foster innovation, voluntary and mutually agreed technology transfers and access to low cost finance. These ambitious outcomes delivered by India's G20 presidency are a true testament to India's own domestic success, where we've been able to successfully achieve affordable, just and clean energy transition and achieve a population scale impact hand in hand. Some of these include Sobhagya, which has electrified 2.86 crore households, Ujala, where we have distributed 36.86 crore LED bulbs and saved 47 billion kWh of energy, uh, the Prime Minister e-bus seva, where 57,000 crores for 10,000 e-buses were uh, spent, uh, and net zero Indian railways by 2030. Uh, the capital investment of 35,000 crores for net zero and energy transition and the green hydrogen mission worth about 20,000 crores. So India has thus addressed affordability, accessibility, sustainability and energy security at a scale, allowing it to take examples of real climate action to G20 tables and successfully deliver some of the most ambitious clean energy outcomes of the G20 ever. I strongly believe achieving net zero emissions is essential to address the India's climate crisis and limit the most devastating effects of climate change, which can have direct and indirect impact on ecosystem we live in. Hamper energy security balance, lead to serious health issues and have macroeconomic implications. Countries should aim to achieve decarbonized industrialization and this creates a great opportunity for countries in Asia and most importantly for India as we have already chartered the new pro-planet development model. India sits at a unique leadership position to drive climate oriented outcomes where we are the only G20 country in the top 10 rankings of the climate change performance index. India is amongst the few emerging economies which has been showing exemplary leadership in RE capacity additions as part of its energy transition goals. 
not just on the account RE, which is being added at an unprecedented speed, but an economy-wide transition has been observed as well. India has been substantially increasing its RE capacity over the years and has one of the most ambitious global RE installation targets by 2030. To further drive RE adoption, green hydrogen will play a pivotal role in the coming years, critical in RE intermittency management and decarbonizing hard to abate sectors. With more than 70% of our buildings yet to be built, it is also critical that we address the embodied energy of the building construction material and move towards greener building models, ensuring that we avoid the heat islands effects and promote integrated resource management for urban development. This transition is not just going to be replacement of one type of energy by cleaner sources, rather this is going to be much more deep rooted and has to be inclusive. Green development as a concept also runs true for just energy transition in Indian states. Indian states will inherently have to continue focusing on different clean energy technologies to achieve their just energy transition strategies based on their state preparedness. The key is to ensure that no one is left behind from the benefits of transition. One of the key issues, therefore, is to make this transition fair, affordable and impactful for all. In the Indian context, inclusiveness is key because the bottom of the pyramid in terms of development discourse is critical. Industries, particularly the MSMEs, may find it difficult to make the transition. For that, appropriate capacity building and institutional support are required as we move ahead. It has been observed in the latest UNFCC synthesis that the world is not doing enough to keep the temperature limit of 1.5 degrees well within the reach of the countries. And the time is running out as well. Given this challenge, the speed of mitigation action and scale are going to be important. The world needs to triple its RE capacity additions to keep the temperature limits within reach. And we have also highlighted this as one of our key G20 outcomes this year. This would only be possible with the accelerated pace of deployment and financial support with more than US dollar 4 trillion per annum for energy transitions in developing countries. Financial support of all forms are necessary. Therefore, public financing and private financing should go hand in hand. In fact, in the energy sector, public financing needs to play the role of absorbing the risk to investments. Given that India is moving towards 24 into 7 RE arrangements, these de-risking arrangements through public resources are going to be key to attracting more private finance. Private finance possesses the potential to plug the financing gap for net zero targets and the presidency aims to strengthen the de and deploy mechanisms such as blended financing, credit enhancement measures such as guarantees, debt for climate swaps, climate policy performance bonds, green bonds, impact investing and carbon pricing framework. I'm sure all these issues will be discussed in greater detail over the next two days across the cross-cutting themes of ACE 2023. To conclude, I believe the cornerstone of all our efforts must be the need to move away from a status quo approach. We need to usher radical transformation and this must be disruptive and it must help us to usher the global south towards green, innovative and responsible growth. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Khan, for that inspiring speech. I would now like to invite uh, Mr. Ghansham Prasad for his address. Good morning. Good morning to everyone. Let me first thank Bharat for inviting me to be a part of this very, very important series of workshops that has been being organized under the banner of ACE, Accelerated Clean Energy for India. I think this is more important. And after hearing Bharat and uh, Amitabh Kanji, I think all the key words have already been said. I don't see any missing link in the key words which is being highlighted as far as the clean energy transition is concerned. So I'll not repeat what has, has already been said, but definitely those words which were being spoken by Amitabh Kanji. In fact, I was also associated with energy transition working group which was being steered by ministry of power and all these things we deliberated during g20 and tried to chart out 
the global perspective and how do we really achieve energy transition across the world and in particular in the context of India. How do we really go about it? In fact, many a times when we talk about energy transition and let me be very honest myself, I think I have been talking on this subject for last four to five years and every in every conference, I, I really, my concept changes. Initially, when we started talking about energy transition, we always used to say, okay, energy transition only means that let's go for solar, let's go for wind, and that's it. And maybe probably plant some trees and do something of that nature so that we will be able to achieve that kind of energy transition in the country. When we started deep diving into it and tried to see that this is not enough, there are so many other things that is required. Ultimately, even yesterday, let me give you a very practical example. Honorable Minister was taking a review on COP28 preparedness. Since our team will also be there, he was MNRE and Ministry of Power was sitting together. And we all spoke that these are the, some of the things that we would like to press upon in the COP28 when we really negotiate there. Then he asked a very simple question. He says, what is the key objective? Are we moving towards energy transition or are we trying to say that solar is required or wind is required or coal phase down is required or what was being mentioned is hard to abate sector should be focused and all. But what is that key? What is the objective of energy transition? Where we are, why, why energy transition first of all? Is the energy transition the objective or something else is objective? I think the mood point every time we miss is, is we are talking about reduction in carbon emissions so that at least global warming does not happen. Probably that's the key. And if we have that in our mind, that in our focus, then there are so many other solutions. Instead of many a times we only simply try to hardcore that okay, you don't do this and you need to do only this. Because in the in entire ecosystem, everybody will have to coexist because of certain aims and objectives. Say for example, the consumer themselves. The consumer needs to be provided electricity. Situation has come in India that now you can't even think of having going for a load shedding, right? There were times when even there used to be load shedding for 10 hours, 12 hours, people used to bear about it. Now, if you just think about uh, even 10 seconds of load shedding, there will be hue and cry on that. So that means one objective definitely is towards the clean side of it. The second objective definitely is to continue the expectations of the consumer as well. And these are the two diverse objectives with which I think we have to chart out our course for India. In if, if I may say so. And which means that we lead to energy security part of it. And if we have to have energy security part of it, because we have also seen what was the impact during the Ukraine war, wherein all other countries got impacted, even India also got impacted because of that. But somehow we could sustain and not much happened except for some few PESA increase in, in the energy cost, but at least we were able to maintain the supply to our consumers. So energy security, keeping the objectives clear in our mind, we need to chart out the course of action. And probably that is where what Bharat was referring to as CA's role, wherein we had tried to project something that what path we need to take it, particularly in the power sector saying that, okay, this is how we need to go. This is how, how so much, say, solar or so much wind or so much storage, so much of battery energy storage, etc., etc., is required into the system. We have also said in the NEP, what Bharat did not mention is, we have also said that if we are not able to achieve the base case, then what happens? Then you will be having a different scenarios. Let's say, for example, the solar what I'm targeting or the non-fossil what I'm targeting to be reaching somewhere around 65 or 68 percent by 31, 32. If we are not able to achieve, because there are so many constraints to it, 
there could be a land constraint there could be water constraint there could be environmental constraint there could be so so many constraint that could happen in these areas if this doesn't happen then what do you do so that at least the energy security is not at, st at stake of course definitely we will be meeting our commitment of cop 26 i was there is no doubt about it we are already at 43 40 43.5% so just meeting going incremental of around 6.5 to 7 percent is not a big challenge for us now under the present scenario but then this is not the end of it we would definitely would like to accelerate the pace but if that doesn't happen then we should be prepared for that and that is where the role of the other segment comes which we are mostly shy in talking which is the coal bucket which india has other countries are also talking very frequently about the gas part of it and nobody says anything on the gas element of it and let me give you a small figure if you see in terms of emission ratios it's just one is to two which means if coal based plants contributes something like 900 odd figures gas also contributes or something around 500 odd figures yesterday i was trying to take a review on that and I, what I could see is the measures that India has taken even in the coal sectors is also quite good. Say for example, we moved from subcritical to critical and then now supercritical and trying to move towards ultra supercritical and then maybe advanced ultra supercritical. In that emission we have already reduced. We have reduced from something like 1000 to now 732 or 712 what I was given the last figure, the new plant which is having it. Efforts are on to reduce to it. So yesterday I was, I was discussing with the OEMs. So can we reduce this emission to a gas level? And it is not, not very difficult. I think within next four years, we will be able to come and bring down the new plant emission to somewhere around the gas level which is which will be somewhere around 450 to even 500 so what a big deal even if we have coal if we are matching this emission with gas i think that we have already achieved where other other countries are also targeting to it or else let's also target that gas also needs to be phased out from 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 the kitty of the power sector then and that's that's where we are in fact a lot of people suggested us that when you are doing the energy transition why don't you also target the gas as an intermediary solution to your energy transition we said no either we are this side or the other side of it and we'll go 100 percent clean and that is how we accelerated the pace of development of solar wind etc etc we'll continue doing that absolutely no issues but at the same time we'll also try to see that how we reduce the emission and this is what I said when I touched upon the broad objective of the energy transition. The objective is to reduce the emission and that is where we will be doing it. And second part is which we have again led in the world is the carbon capture part of it. NTPC has already demonstrated that how do we really capture carbon so that we are able to at least reduce the effect of the carbon emission even if it is going to happen in the power plants of course in that process we will be generating methanol ethanol etc etc whatever it is and these will again be a, a good byproduct for india which we will be using it in different processes which will really again be helpful to our own countries the, of course the next step that comes is how do we really go about the storage part of it and storage india again has kicked in and since it is an opportunity we have seen a lot of private investors who are now coming and trying to support us with respect to the hydro pump storage again that's another key areas because in storage space again we have to be very very careful many people wants to push about the battery energy storage system which as of now we are trying to import that those elements and what happens after 12 years 15 years is it still environment friendly those questions are still live we have not still tackled these questions wherein the storage that means the hydro pump storage is definitely the cleanest form of energy that at least i perceive in the storage space and that is how india will be trying to push this segment of it in a much larger manner
In fact, NEP did project some figure. Let me again correct you that we have changed those revision, not made public, but definitely in the discussions with the hydro PSPs, we have taken those things into account. So once that happens, then the, the battery side will keep on reducing. So 26, 27, till 26, 27, we will not be requiring, officially we will not be requiring any battery energy storage. So of course, we'll be continue adding up some of them as a pilot as to learn the their behavior because battery can be used for a different use cases. Those use cases will continue studying it so that when we need it, we can Im immediately add on to our system, add on to our grid so that the, the challenges does not remain. Anything battery gestation period is very less, could be around one year, and that's a, that's a time when we can immediately take action and try to try to put into the system. But th the PSPs definitely wanted a greater amount of push, and all the policy decisions what we have taken, particularly in the hydro development and the hydro PSP development, is trying to accelerate that process. Environment Ministry of Environment and Forest is also helping us in that, and. Just to quote a figure, as of now, I have 53,000 megawatt PSP, closed loop PSP, which have been given TOR, cleared TOR from Ministry of Environment and Forest. So that's the kind of effort that is going on. And this has given us a confidence in CA as well, because we have also accelerated the process of Congress. GSI and CWC is also with us. So in that, we are hoping now that by 31, 32, we should be reaching somewhere around 35 to 40 gigawatt of PSP from a figure of just 4.7 as of now. That means in next 10 years or nine years, I'm targeting almost like 10 fold increase in, 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 this, in this capacity. That's, that's how the people, I mean, what we need to do is okay, so we can keep on talking about the, the big, big jargons, just transition, energy transition, hard to abate, all these jargons I learned during the G20 things. But what actually comes to, comes to reality is we need to chart out the course of action for India. And that is where the role of CA, the role of policymakers, and most important is the, the organizations like WRI, Prayas, and all of you who are sitting here, the feedback that comes from you to all of to the policymakers, to organizations like us, really helps in charting out the course of action. Let me assure you that uh, whether it is Ministry of Power, CA, MNRE, all of us are working in sync to see that the 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 pace of development or pace of transition to clean energy for India is accelerated at a, at a pace which probably is much much faster than any other countries in the world thank you so much